So my family and I are currently in a situation where we are considered homeless. We do not have a home. Cuba and her family have been considered homeless since May of 2013. For a while, they were staying at a beach in Eva in their car. It was a little cramped, of course, and couldn't stand it because of my brother snoring. But we made do with what we had. I thought, you know, this is my last year in high school. I want to make some kind of difference, some kind of impact. And also, I shouldn't be ashamed of my story because I shared it with my friends and their reaction was so opposite from what I thought. They were more positive. They told me, why didn't you tell us? We wanted to help you. Um, and, you know, the people I'm surrounded with and the people I care about, they encouraged me to share my story. So that's really what pushed me. 17-year-old Victoria Cuba had no idea how her decision to speak openly about being homeless on PBS Hawaii's Hikino Student News, later picked up on Hawaii News Now, would turn out. With her family's blessing and the support of her friends, the high school senior took a chance. Victoria Cuba, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Victoria Cuba and her family first became homeless on Oahu when Victoria was in elementary school. They got through it with help from friends and above all, their positive attitude. But the problems did not end. Instead, new difficulties arose as time went on. What happened to so that you, you ended up homeless in elementary school? Uh, I lived with my mom and my brother, and um, we lived in regular houses, you know, always renting. Um, finally, we stayed in an apartment called the Weed and Seed. It's a government-funded building. Mm -hmm. So um, we stayed there, and it was about 10 years, so it was really nice. But um, being that she was the only one working and taking care of me and my brother, it was hard for her to keep up with the, the rent. So um, because we didn't pay it in on time, we got evicted. Um, and when we became homeless, she always told us, you know, don't worry, we'll get out of this. You know, at least we have each other, and that was the one thing I always remembered. Um, and she worked us out of that situation. Well, first, when you're approaching eviction and you know you're going to be turned into the street, how do you decide where to go? The first time and this time that we're homeless, we actually had family friends that helped us, you know, you can stay here. The first time we were homeless, we stayed in a Matson container, uh, the really long shipping containers, and that was our home. Um, I remember a lot of, like, my mom would tell me that, oh, we should put a second one on top and make a two-story house. So, <laughs> was that on somebody's private property? Uh, yeah, it was at the junkyard in Pearl City. So um, we stayed there for, let's see, um, over half a year. Um, and then we got, we had to move because the river near the junkyard flooded and we lost everything. And it wasn't a good place to stay because mildew and you know, health-wise it wasn't well. So we ended up staying with an auntie at our old building and, you know, in, she, in her house. Mm -hmm. And we stayed with her, and eventually my mom got enough money to um, find our own place. So we stayed in Aniani, which is like right across the street from where we're living. And um, we stayed there for four years. It was nice to have a house, a roof over your head. Yes, yes. When we moved into Aniani, it made me appreciate that we had a house because of what we've been through. And in school, I used to get really touchy about people talking about, oh, look at that hobo on the streets. Like, you don't know their story. You can't say stuff like that. You can't say something until you've been in their shoes. So, you know, just to be more grateful, more appreciative of what you have. That ended, though. What happened then? Um, this time around, my mom's health started declining. She kind of stopped going to work because she would always go to the hospital to the doctors. And um, she got terminated, she got laid off at her, her job. So um, we found ourselves without income. We found ourselves getting eviction notices from the landlord, um, constantly coming. If she came, we tried to keep it as quiet as possible because we didn't want her coming. Um, and we got kicked out. So what's it like? You're packing your stuff and you're heading to the sidewalk again. Well, the first time it wasn't too bad because 
I always thought, you know, my family's here. The place we actually stayed at, I had a lot of fun. I could climb trees and, you know, we built a swing out of fire hose, so that was nice. But um, the second town in Maryland, I was like, I was mad at my mom. I said, how could you, in my mind it was, how could you let your children go through this again? And I know it's not her fault, but you know, I just wanted, I was going through my rebellious stage of being a teenager, probably still am, um, but I was just disappointed. Like, why do we have to go through this again, the second time, we've already been through it. There's a lot of pressure on your mother. How does she keep this confidence and positive attitude going, or does she? Um, the first time I remember she did, she always reminded us constantly, you know, be grateful, be grateful. Um, this time around, I guess it's because of her health or stress, but I kind of felt like she gave up this time. You know, she's currently unemployed. I asked, are you going to get a job? But then again, her health is, you know, wearing on her. And then, I don't know, I was just, I remember talking to her one night. It was when I was still mad at her. I said, you know, it how come you're not doing anything? It's like you gave up on yourself. And then she says, yeah, I did. And I remember crying and I said, you know, how can you give up on yourself? You still have me and Nicholas to t take care of. If you give up on yourself, you're giving up on us. So I remember she was just quiet. And, um, you know, I just want to help her. She's helped us already. And, like, I just want to pay her back. How's your brother doing and how old is he? He's 15. Um, he's still in high school. He's in JROTC, um, and that really helped him. Like he's, he knows what he wants to do. He wants to go into the military. Um, he wants to help my mom and our family. And by going to the military, he can do that. And he has some kind of purpose. I remember in, when he was an intermediate, he, he wasn't doing too well grade-wise. But because he has JROTC, he has a more positive outlook, and it keeps him steady and focused. How did the family plan the next step? Um, again, a family friend helped us out. They said that we could stay in front of their house. Um, the neighbors were really kind enough to let us stay in their stalls, so where we're parked at. So you, you had one, is it a van that you parked? Mm -hmm. There's a van um, that we have. Uh, all of our stuff is in there, my mom's car. And um, the neighbor who's right next to where we live, he has a truck that's like parked right next to the van. And he said, you know, it looks a little cramped in where you guys are staying. Why don't you use the truck as well? So um, we threw a tarp over it and then laid down carpet on the bed, on the bed of the truck, and that became my room. So. And what's it like to have a bedroom in the back of a truck? Pretty interesting. It was messy because I made it messy. But um, it's, it's neat to think that you can have some kind of hideout. It's Privacy. Like a, yeah. So... For me, I like to think about the positive. So when I was living in a junkyard, it was like, ooh, I have all these adventures I can go on. And this time it's like, I have my own room. And think about how many people can have a outside room in the truck. So that was my thinking. The homelessness of teenager Victoria Cuba presented her with challenges that made her grow up faster than most of her friends. She worked hard to create and maintain normalcy. Still, while she was able to fit in at school, her life was very different from that of her classmates when she wasn't at school. Everyday simple things are so much harder when you don't have a, a place to live with uh, running water and, and privacy. So what is the routine? You know, when you wake up, where do you brush your teeth and how do you, how do you get clean? Um, what are, what's the routine? Um, and you, you don't have a refrigerator? No. Of any kind? Do you have an ice chest? Uh, we do, and we buy ice when we can. So, um, daily wise, um, the school was kind enough to let us shower at there, at the gym, so we could shower there. But the thing is, we have to wake up really early. So. Um, and the janitor lets you in early? Is mm -hmm. that what happens? So, we go to the office, and the principals or the vice principal would come and take us, and they'd let us in. There's like two separate showers, so that's nice. Um, actually, the neighbors also lent us a, a sink, like an outside sink. So we hooked it up to a hose and we used that to wash up, you know, stay clean. Uh, we use a hose to shower, but it gets really cold, so we have to shower during the day. But it's nice now because it's really hot. Food-wise, uh, I'm so glad we have food stamps because 
you know, we can buy food on a daily basis. We don't have to worry about that. And that was the first time we were homeless, we always had to worry about food. We would only have food either for that day or would last it till the, for the week. So it was kind of hard. Because you didn't have food stamps then? Yeah, we didn't have. So we were um, relying on my mom's income. So then again, it made it hard for us to find a place. Um, but this time we have food stamps and it's just a lot easier now. Yeah, and uh, I know you're limited in what you can buy, but, mm -hmm. you, but you can eat healthy foods, enough healthy food from the food stamps? I guess if we prepare it, <laughs> like as long as we cook it, um, as long as it keeps out of the sun. But me and my brother, well, How do I you cook it? Where do you cook it? We have a propane stove. So another thing we have to buy is propane, which is, I mean, it's, I guess you would say it's inexpensive, but it's kind of expensive if you have to buy it every week. But for me, I'm kind of easy to feed. Like, I can live off of Simon and Vienna sausage. Yeah, Vienna sausage is my favorite food. And I actually got Lay's for graduation made of Vienna sausage. <laughs> so that was nice. <laughs> what about school lunch? Mm, we have free school lunch. And actually, I worked in a cafeteria um, during my junior and senior year. So, you know, I'd go for breakfast and for lunch. And then um, I remember one of the workers uh, gave us food sometimes if we couldn't afford to cook. We got pi paid $9 an hour, but then again, we only work a couple hours a week. So, I mean, but it paid, it did pay. When you've told people, um, what's the reaction? The first people I told was my friends, um, and they didn't know. They didn't, they said, you know, you didn't look like it. Um, and that's because every day when I came to school, I, my mentality changed. It's not, I'm not focusing at home. It's I'm focusing on school and what's going on. And it's good to have friends that accept you because even after I told them, nothing changed because I'm still the same person, just with different circumstances. So, you know, they said, you're always smiling, you know, always laughing, always focused. And then they said, yeah, because that's what you come to school for, not to bring your problems there. I'm not sure if a lot of schools do this, but my Powell High School has so many resources, and they really did help me and my family. And I'm sure they're helping so much more students, because there is other students that are in the same situation. And it's, it's is it hard to to not know what's going to come next? You know, you don't you don't know where your where your family will be living. You don't know if your mom will have a job. It's not hard because life is, I, I just want to share this. Um, I remember going to this program and we had this debate, is life hard? Mm -hmm. And we finally figured out it's not hard because life isn't hard, hard is, you know, physically hard. It's not hard, it's difficult. And it, life is only difficult if you make it. So it's not difficult for me and my family. I mean, I do wonder if we are gonna get a house or not um, or if we get some kind of shelter. But it's better to think on a day-to-day -day basis instead of thinking about, I need to do this, I need to do that. You just worry yourself and, you know, you probably make your life a lot shorter by worrying about stuff like that. Yeah, take, take, take it day by day. Mm -hmm. you, you just said that you um, changed when you got to school. You, put, you were confident and focused. So what does that mean home is like? Um, you, dropped, you dropped the um, go for it attitude. It's not necessarily that I changed attitudes. Um, it's more like I focused on what was in front of me. So, I mean, I still had that kind of attitude, you know, like one day we'll get out of this. That was my more, that was more my thinking and mentality when I'm at home. You know, we'll get out of it. We got out of it once, we can get out of it again. Waipahu High School has so many different kinds of students mm -hmm. and you, you, can, you can kind of see people from the vantage point of somebody who, who's kind of an outlier, you know, you don't have a lot of the things that some of the other students take for granted. Do you find yourself reflecting on that? I do, every day. And I sometimes remind my classmates, like when I did the interview for Hikino, my friends were there and um, I told them in the interview, I said, you know, some students worry about, oh, my phone is dying or my clothes don't match and stuff like that. But there were other worries you have to worry about and whenever I see that, you know, I, I kind I, I hope I kindly tell them. I tell them that, you know, there's, there's things in life that you have to worry about more than just these small things. 
At 17, Victoria Cuba has had more challenging life experiences than most people her age, and probably even people twice her age. Being the positive person that she is, she's taken it all in and wants to do something useful with the knowledge she's gained. You want to be a storyteller and you're already noticing stories all around you. Mm -hmm. And you've told your own, so that gives you a sense of what it's like when you go public with something that has previously been on the QT. As a result of telling your story on the Hiki No program and then also uh, Hawaii News Now with Jim Mendoza picked up the story, um, you did get a lot of public reaction. What was that like and, and what was it? What did, they, what did people say to you? F strangers, I mean. First of all, I checked on Facebook, you know, multimedia, um, and there was a lot of positive feedback. So I was really surprised. I was like, wow, you know, people think that? I thought it would have been more negative, like, oh, send, send her back to wherever she came from or something like that. The night I watched it, the next day I was worrying, like, what is everybody else going to think? What is, what is going to happen tomorrow? So I went to school and, you know, everybody was like, hey, you know, um, congratulations on your story. And, you know, you're really inspiring. A lot of teachers, a lot of students did that. And then there were some students who, like, you know, just stared. And I got that feeling like, oh, please don't stare at me. What was running through my mind all day was that um, just because of this story, it doesn't mean I change. I'm still the same person. So, you know, don't look at me differently. <laughs> um, there were some strangers, like I'd be going to media events, um, winding up the wires, and they'd be like, are you the girl on the TV? And they were like, yeah. And then they would say, you know, can I give you a hug? Cause you know, oh. you're very inspirational. Even though they say I'm inspirational, just hearing that they heard my story and you know, they wanna make a difference because of it, that's inspirational for me. Has anyone ever given you attitude? The first time, no, cause then again, nobody knew. This time, um, there are some people who were like, you don't belong here, you need to get out. But then again, we're not on their property. The neighbors always say, you can't tell them get out, they're on our property, so you can butt out of it. Um, virally, like on Facebook, there has been some negative, conf um, negative comments. As a result of your sharing your story? Um, yes. So the first time, it wasn't about my situation. It was more like the things I had. So they said, you know, I was dressed in a dress for my interview with Jim Mendoza, and they said, if she's homeless, how come she has nice clothes? And it's, you know, that stereotype that gets to them. And um, I wanted to say something, but my mom said, you know, it's better not to. But not actually- Not to respond? Mm -hmm. I mean, do they want you to be in rags? I know, right? So, I mean, just because you're homeless doesn't give you no excuse to um, not dress nicely. And the people who don't dress nicely, it's maybe they can't afford to or people aren't helping them. So um, people came to my rescue. They said, you know, just because she's in that situation doesn't mean this. And um, the people who actually gave me the clothes, they said, you know, I'm glad my clothes fit you. So it's like, that's where my clothes came from. Um, like just clearing the air about it. And um, I don't know, there was just some negative people, not a lot barely, which I was so surprised about, but they were, you know, that, that ignorance that they don't know about what it is to be homeless or that stereotype they have in their mind. Did people offer you money or a home or your mom a job, anything like that? Um, there's been a lot of requests like that. Um, I have classmates, parents telling me that, you know, if my mom wants a job, then to contact them. Um, people have been sending money to the school um, to donate for, you know, for me to go to college. And my reaction to that one was that at first I didn't want the money because I felt like I hadn't earned it. Just because I told my story doesn't mean I earned their money. So I told my principal that and he said, you know, you have to look at it differently. It's, it's not just about you, even though it may seem right now. Um, it'll actually help others and it'll grow from that. Um, and he said that there were other people who were willing to donate to the school itself for future students who are in the same situation. So because of that, I felt a lot better. You know, I don't want them to just help me. I, I want them to help others as well. Did you go to prom? Yes, I did. Actually, an anonymous donor at my school paid for my prom because for me, I had money 
and I saved up from my checks that I got from school. And for me, it was choosing between paying for my AP test or going to prom. And my main concern was my AP test because it's graded and it's going to college. Um, but um, our student coordinator called me and she said, you know, somebody's willing to pay for your prom. Are you okay with that? I said, uh, you know, I do want to go to prom, but I have to pay for my AP test too. So I said, you know, I feel bad. But she said, you know, don't feel bad. They want to help you. So I accepted it and um, they paid for my prom. But dress wise, I actually went to Ross to go buy my dress. So, I mean, it was a more inexpensive way of going to prom. Did you have fun? Yes, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was probably, I didn't want the night to end. And you are going to be able to use money from a scholarship fund established by the school mm -hmm. to go to the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Yes, but really, if I don't have to use it, then I won't use it. Because I still signed up for my scholarships outside of school. Um, and if I get word from them, then I won't use the money. Because I really, I really don't feel like I've earned that money. I, I feel like I shouldn't use it. It doesn't feel right. I, th I think people meant it for you in the best possible way. I know, but... <laughs> Is it hard for you to accept a gift? Kinda. I mean, I've been brought up by my mom, and she's really old school fashioned. So, um, you know, if someone gives something to you, you have to give back. Or, um, you know, you shouldn't accept too easily because, you know, there's people who worked hard for it and I really don't feel like I deserve the, the, I guess, the gifts that people have been giving. And so you, you're on your way to college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I was applying for colleges, my counselor asked, are you going to worry about your family? And I said, of course, because they're my family. But she said, you know, if you want to help them, you need to focus on you and school first. And I'm a little worried about that, like if I'm going to be able to focus on school if I'm worrying about my family as well. But, you know, I just have to keep thinking the only way I'm going to help them is if I focus on school. And, you know, I do wish I could bring my family, but it's not possible. And my mom understands. What got you so interested in storytelling? When I was in this, um, community program, um, one of my, our mentors, we called her auntie, um, she got me into journal writing. Um, I was going through a hard time with my family and I remember I kept everything in because, you know, when I was growing up, I always learned that your business is nobody else's business, so you shouldn't let it known. But one, down, one time I just came to the program and I broke down crying because, you know, it's just everything building up. And she said, you know, you shouldn't do that. So why don't you put it in words and write it down? So I did that, you know, kept journals, wrote down random stuff. And um, I noticed that when I look back in it, year, like days, months later, it's like, wow, I've really been through that? It's amazing just to see the change in yourself. I still have journals that show that. Um, but, you know, if, if I could see that change in myself, why can't I do it for other people? So that was really what got me into storytelling and hearing other people's stories. A lot of it is finding out how other people tick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, you know, when, when somebody tells you their story, they give, you, they give themselves to you, a piece of themselves. So every time a friend tells me something they've never told anything else, I am so grateful and I tell them that. I, say, I tell them, you know, thank you for sharing this with me. I know it's hard, but you know, being that you share it with me means you trust me. You uh, were one of the lead uh, media team members on a Hikino story about someone in your school, mm -hmm. I believe, a blind person who had perfect pitch. Mm -hmm. So um, his name is Rocky. Uh, actually, his, his real name is Rick Long Jack. Um, and he's, he was in my grade. And um, this kid is talented, really amazing. Did you like the process of figuring out what you're going to ask people? How are you going to shoot them? What I love about Hikino is that students are allowed the freedom to choose what they want to tell. And they have the freedom to decide how they're going to tell it. So um, that's what I liked about it. And, um, you know, it's actually going into the production and doing things that real newscasters do. So, you know, being able to experience that kind of um, job ethic. 
what makes the most compelling story for you to cover? A story that nobody has told before or something that somebody's never said before. So, you know, those untold stories are what people want to hear. At the time of our conversation in the summer of 2014, Victoria Cuba was starting classes at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, preparing to move into a dormitory and study journalism. Best wishes to teenager Victoria Cuba from Waipahu for being such an inspiration. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and long story short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. My name is Rick Long Jack, and I'm 18 years old. I'm 12th grade at Waipao High School. Rick Long Jack, a.k.a. Rocky, is like many students with aspirations of becoming a singer and music producer. Rocky has a bright future ahead of him. The challenges he faces, however, may dim his path. Rocky is visually impaired. These difficulties, however, do not discourage Rocky from seeing beyond his disabilities. Through his experiences, Rocky wants to share one message. Don't let your limitations stop you. This is Victoria Cuba reporting from Waipahu High School for Hikino.